New figures from the United Nations show that an average of two children have drowned every day since last September. Well, CBS News has confirmed that a sixth migrant child has died after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. And I know it's politically not necessarily correct, but I'll say it, and I'll say it loud. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Well, it's time to throw political correctness in the garbage. This is Islamic terrorism. The fact is, Muslim immigration means more Islamic terrorism. It's just that simple. We have to protect ourselves. There's no way we can let them in. Even the crisis has had its tragic episodes, uh, like the Alain Kurdi incident in 2015. Especially in Europe, media tends to feed into negative public perceptions on, on refugees. I think you predominantly see two discourses on refugees. One being that they are bringing a threat with them, either crime or a threat to, let's say, the, the national identity, where they think that they will overrun the culture of that country. The busiest U.S. border crossing is open again this morning after a confrontation forced it to close temporarily yesterday. These refugees are coming over, and you said 350 a day, but they're doing more than just coming over and being polite individuals. They're changing the demographics and they're changing the way our country is run in many ways, more than one. If Islam is so fantastic, why do Muslims always flee to Christian countries? Isn't it because Christian lands are free and tolerant and open? And isn't that the very thing that Muslims try and change when they arrive in our country? At the same time, there's this other discourse that is kind of victimizing. We can see that it actually reflects international media's response to refugees, such as perceiving Syrian refugees as victims, sometimes as a threat, both in terms of socioeconomic reasons or as a security threat. But day by day, I saw that the media become political. They are just trying to show what their government or what their sponsors want to, especially in the Europe. They are just trying to show the migrants uh, they are in the camps, they have uh, nothing to do. They are just always waiting for the uh, help from the government, waiting for the, their needs to come to them. Well, the biggest, the biggest false misconception is that refugees bring an extreme threat to our national security. Among these migrants are embedded a lot of ISIS, uh, you know, personnel, a lot of potential terrorists. The fact is, Muslim immigration means more Islamic terrorism. It's just that simple. Well, of course, the most prominent one that we've been facing is this relation of the migrants and refugees with terrorism. Uh, I mean, you can cite hundreds of articles, hundreds of research that say that refugees actually have a much lower uh, incidence of crime. Of the more than three million refugees admitted from 1975 to the end of 2015, 20 were terrorists. One incident takes place, one person from Syria assaulting a woman, and then immediately the public reacts towards the entire group of Syrians in that region. That is the first and I think most important link because it is also creating the fear, right? It is adding into that fear of the people, like they are saying, these people are coming, we are not safe anymore. I'm mother of three children and we are here together to protest against the aggressivity of people who are grabbing our children and who are, um, yeah, who are bringing fear in our country. I think we've all seen them. These images of boats stacked with people on the Mediterranean or on the Aegean Sea. Then this awful image, this tragic event of Alan Kurdi washed up on the shore of the Aegean. Nothing has captured this crisis like the picture that we began with last night the three-year-old Syrian boy who washed up, drowned, on a Turkish beach. It's hard to watch, but it should be seen. Every journalism student in America that goes, takes a journalism class, has to take a media ethics course. And in those courses, we talk about what kind of decisions we have to make as journalists, whether it's right to publish violent photographs or whether it's ethical to make decisions like that, display dead bodies or that use this kind of a, a dead three-year-old in that sense. And what we have to consider is what impact it will have 
Oh, you, I think you have to publish the photo. You have to publish it widely. You have to let people see it. As soon as I saw that photo, I recognized that it was going to become one of those photos that changes the course of history. I mean, it's a shame that it took a, a picture of a dead child in order to draw that up, but at the same time, it got people moving, it got people realizing what kind of drastic situation these countries were in, what these people were in. So in a sense, I mean, it, it was the right editorial decision in my opinion. I think it's okay to uh, publish such images if they have a purpose. What I mean is the independence, for instance, the UK Daily. When they published the image, they simultaneously started an online campaign asking their readers to sign a petition urging the British government to, to accept more refugees, to take more responsibility. Today I can announce that we will do more, providing resettlement for thousands more Syrian refugees. I don't think there is a case in British history where government policy has been changed overnight um, on the basis of one photograph. David Cameron literally changed government policy overnight. So I guess, uh, in a way, the media becomes an important tool in mobilizing the public in a positive way. One image may not change the whole discussion, but it can actually have an important contribution if the political context also allows it. Was it effective? For a moment, yes. I do think we moved to a more humanized debate about migration, but only for so long. I don't think it is helping anybody to show those boats. I mean, imagine the body of Ayla and Kurdi. Remember 2015, September? The entire media, I mean, it was almost globally acknowledged, actually came up to it, this one photo of a little boy on the Aegean shore. And what was the reaction? There are just so many contradictions. We mourn the tragic death of two-year-old Ayla and Kurdi. And yet, since then, more than 200 children have subsequently drowned in the Mediterranean. New figures from the United Nations show that an average of two children have drowned every day since last September. It has opened a public debate, but then there were many other drowned kids and the media did not really show the same attention. And the result was what? Turkey EU readmission agreement. Did it help much? No. As I said, it only changed the rules and it had some kind of a deterrence effect. Did it really make any positive impact on the people? So are they feeling much more for these people on the boat now? Not really. They, they keep on seeing these as invaders who are coming to get their jobs or who are coming to get their schools. So I don't know, I, I, can, I cannot see any, any positive outcome of those images. And I think one thing we should also not forget is again the element of race here. I think they were only humanizing to a certain extent. When black and brown bodies are not as valued as a white body, these images really can only do as much. So we very quickly move to a discourse of crisis, something unprecedented, a flood of people coming to Europe. And then we see a turn to more strict border controls. I think what is affecting the media's discourse on this is more coming from the upper class of politicians. I mean, we saw a big radical change in how the media was portraying refugees when Donald Trump was elected. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Prior to that, it was just kind of a very, I don't want to say mundane, but it was a much, much less polarized and much less violent perception of who these people were and what they tried to do. In the European context, you can also see that the far-right parties use this as a way of gaining votes, I would say, or mobilizing their voters. I think it is largely part of the populism that has been on the rise in, in, in Europe. For example, with the recent crisis in the Mediterranean with the Italian Ministry of Interior. I mean, he made a big issue when a boat that was trying to reach the shores of Italy actually coming in. Quindi, adesso magari cominceranno le litanie e dei professori, e degli intellettuali, delle associazioni, di un cardinale, di 6.000 telegiornali. Aprite, spalancate, abbrocciate, accogliete. No, no, no. But then when you actually look at the numbers, the number of boats arriving to Europe has been decreasing. I mean, this, there was no evidence that Italy has been invaded by immigrants, right? But it really fit well with this political interest of this new rising populism right wing in Europe as well. Noi siamo qua perché siamo contro gli immigrati clandestini. Punto. Because 
it would distract the public from focusing on other issues. I think the biggest problem is that the migrant voice is actually lacking in the conversation. And this is as true for media as it is for politics and civil society. So really just listening to the migrants and refugees themselves is key to actually providing the right support and the right needs. And media now we have uh, the chance uh, to expose all the things and the crimes that are happening. So I guess media is such an important um, uh, weapon that uh, can be really used in uh, such a good way in order to um, cut and break all the stereotypes and uh, to show people what is really happening.